All right, so let's start, otherwise it's going to be too late. Thank you so much, Evelyn. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I cannot thank you enough for doing this. I know it's, it takes time. Uh, I really, really appreciate for you doing this. Uh, <coughs> and I'm trying to, I try to make this as public, I say make this public and spread the word to as many students as possible because we professors we are not jealous so we we really care about spreading the word about what we do and so on and I know that you the same otherwise you would not give lectures like this and provide materials and just to help the community to get to used to uh, numerical tools in particle physics which are very very useful and very important to us so thank you so much for doing this and <coughs> We already let them know that they should download the files you asked me to. So I guess everybody has already downloaded the, the, the files. I, for instance, I installed SADA for the first time in my life, so I did this last <laughs> night. So what, it's quite straightforward, so you just, it's very easy, at least in Linux it's quite it straightforward. I mean, super easy when I saw that I could just at the very bottom have the UFO files for math graphics. My goodness, that's, that's amazing. Okay, anyway, so thank you so much and take your time. Well, thank you, thank you uh, and good morning. I understand that it's now 11 in Natal, I think. Yeah. Uh, so it's a great pleasure for me to be with you and uh, obrigado pelo convite. Uh, <laughs> costo mucho de estar con vocês. Uh, so uh, I'm very happy to give this course. It's the first time I give it online. I have given it several times, but never online. So maybe it's hard for me to uh, gauge your reaction. So you have a, at any point, any question, any comment, just interrupt me because otherwise uh, I won't be able to know whether I'm going too fast or too slow. Uh, so feel free to interrupt and ask questions or comments. Okay, so let me so just I'm add one thing. Sorry, uh, Jacinto, Camila, and Clarice to turn off your uh, camera, so <laughs> for uh, that would be nice and that's the same. All right, <laughs> okay. I will now share my screen uh, this way, I think. Yes, okay. So let me begin with a very short introduction to motivate a little bit this course. So, okay. So this is just to motivate a little bit, you know this already very well, but I like to, to say it anyway. So you know that back in the, in the good old times, it was preposterous to propose a new particle. You, you know very well this anecdote by, by Pauli when he proposed the existence of neutrinos in this famous letter, which I have here. Um, I don't know if you speak German, I don't, so I have an English translation. And you can see that in, in this famous letter, when he proposed the idea of the neutrino, uh, at some point he said that he is somehow embarrassed to propose a new idea. He doesn't dare to publish anything about it. However, this is no longer the case. Nowadays we have new models, new particles every day. So every day you open the archive and you have a new model with, a, I don't know, a hundred new particles. And that's fine. Nobody feels embarrassed about that. Um, and because of that, we need to know many things about our models. We need to derive analytically where are the masses and the, and the coupling for our new particles. We probably have to minimize the potential to calculate RTEs, to study what is the evolution with energy of our interactions. Also, we need some numerical routines because we want to diagonalize mass matrices or to solve these equations numerically. Uh, and we have to do many other things like calculating mass spectra, uh, corrections to our masses uh, at several loops. We have to calculate observables, like flavor observables, and we have to calculate, for example, uh, also dark matter properties or, or do collider simulations. So there are many things that we need to do for every new model that we propose. Many, many things. So what is the usual strategy? So the usual strategy is uh, basically you have a professor that says, please compute, and you have a student that says, okay, I will do it. And then it takes a lot of time. It's a huge effort, as you know very well. And in some cases, it could take years of calculations to, to get a, a final conclusion for specific uh, problems, for, for very complicated models, for example. So this is a usual approach. And what I'm trying to, to say here is that we can automatize this process because uh, basically every time you do this, you have to follow basically the same steps. You have to calculate some things analytically. Then you have to code this into some numerical uh, language 
that allows you to do some numerical calculations properly. Um, and the, the steps that you have to give every time are basically the same. So you can try to automatize the process so that you don't need to have a student doing this every time from scratch. Uh, and I think this is the main motivation for this course, to do things automatically. Now, um, I'm going to tell you about two codes. Uh, today I will concentrate on Sarah, which is the, the driving force of this course, uh, if you want, which is a mathematical package for basically analytical calculations. And then tomorrow I will discuss Sfino, which is a, a code which allows you to do numerical calculations. So they are complementary to each other. So I will explain this much better later, don't worry. Now, the first message that I wanted to tell you is that this is not so hard. So as Farinaldo said already, um, some of these codes have uh, somehow, um, they, they are famous for being very technical or very sophisticated. Maybe not Sarah, but for example, Matra or Micromegas. These are very sophisticated codes. And sometimes we are afraid that it, it will be very hard to learn how to use them. And this is not true. This is not true. They are actually, in some cases, they are very user friendly and learning how to use them is, is very simple. Of course, if you want to be an expert, you need to, of course, you need time. But to start doing things typically is very easy. This is the first message. And second, a very, very, very important message, and this is super important, never forget this, do not trust too much in codes. So very embarrassing mistakes have been made by many people because they trusted too much in codes. So if you do a calculation, you get a result, and I don't know, you get an observable that is way far from what you expected. Maybe the code is wrong, maybe there is a bug. So do not trust your codes uh, and do physics. Try to understand the result using physics, not just trusting blindly what the code is saying. This is super important because all these codes are made by people who are not professionals in the sense of, uh, you know, they are not computer programmers. So th there might be a bug and, and you have to understand your result in order to, to do a proper physics study, okay? And this is super important. Um, so I already told you a little bit about the plan for the course. So today I will discuss Sarah, tomorrow we'll discuss Sfino, and then the last day I, well, I call it final exercise, but what I mean is that I will basically repeat what I have said about Sarah and Sfino using um, a different example. So today you will see that I will use a model to illustrate how to use Sarah. Uh, we will use the same model tomorrow, and then the last day we will wrap up by, by considering a different model and doing everything again with a little bit less trivial model, you will see. Okay, so also the plan is to, to use one hour every day, more or less, but probably today will be a little bit longer because Sarah typically requires a little bit more time if you want to understand all the possible details that you have. But around one hour, anyway. Um, okay, so there are several references. Uh, in particular, I will concentrate very much on this uh, course that I wrote several years ago, which basically will be followed uh, in these uh, lectures. I will, so you don't need to, for example, take notes. You can't take notes, but you don't need to, to for example, write all the commands that I'm going to use because they are written here, so I think that's convenient. There is another course which is also very nice by Florian Stout that you can find in this reference, but this one concentrates on supersymmetric models, so if you are interested in supersymmetry, probably this one is even better for you. You can also go to the manual that you can find online, and all these links, you can find them on this website that Farinaldo sent you already by right. Okay? So, uh, my recommendation is that uh, you have time to visit these links to get familiar with these documents. And um, okay, so before we get started, let me again insist that you can interrupt and ask questions at any moment. You can also follow the course. Uh, maybe this is not so easy because you are <laughs> looking at the screen, but you can try to emulate what I do because now I will start doing stuff with these codes, and you can just observe me. Or if you want, you can try to do it yourself at the same time. And also, I will assume that you have already installed all the prerequisites. For example, I understand that you have Mathematica and you have Fortran. Otherwise, uh, this becomes uh, very complicated. Okay? So I will start. So if you have any comment or question at this moment, I think this is a good point. So let me know if you have a comment or something. No, nothing so far. No? Okay. Mm. As I said, any moment you can interrupt. No problem with that. 
Okay, so let me move to the first lecture then. Uh, have it here. Lecture one. So, as I said already, the first lecture concentrates on, on SARA. So, SARA is a, is a tool that is somehow popular in the community. It was developed by Florian Stahl, but it is currently maintained by two other people, uh, Mark Wutzel and Werner Foro, and it's a Mathematica package. So, as you know, Mathematica packages are very easy to load. You just put them somewhere and you load them in, in Mathematica, and you can use them already. You don't need to compile anything. There is a website where you can find the, the package, you can download it from, from this uh, website. And also there is a forum, so you have very technical questions, which I cannot answer, they will probably be able to do it. So this forum is very helpful, very, very helpful. Um, so what SARA does basically is to do analytical calculations for any model. So it derives the Lagrangian for supersymmetric and, and non-supersymmetric models. It derives all mass matrices of the model, all the vertices of the model, also the minimizes the potential by solving the tadpole equations, calculates corrections to the tadpoles and to the self energies, as well as uh, renormalization group equations, also calculates Wilson coefficients for flavor observables, like for example mu to gamma, and also, and this is super good, super nice, it creates input files for other codes. For example, you can use SARA if you want to study a model in background. You, you run your model in SARA and you use it to create files, UFO files, they are called UFO, to, that you can pass later to, to Macro. The same thing with Micromegas and also, as you will see to the, uh, tomorrow, with the Sphere. Uh, but basically, SARA is analytical calculations. Now, there are many models which are already implemented in SARA. I have a list here, which is probably, probably not updated. I'm very sure about that. Many of them are supersymmetric, but there is also a very good list with non-supersymmetric models. And you can see, for example, of course, the standard model is there, but you have also models uh, a bit more complicated. You have here the list. And um, in supersymmetry, I mean, one of the things is that SARA was originally created uh, for supersymmetric models. So the list of models in supersymmetry is a bit longer. But as you can see, also the list of models without supersymmetry is uh, pretty, pretty good. Okay, so this is what I wanted to say now. So let me start doing things with Sarah. So if you have downloaded the, the files that are uh, in the website, you have these four files in your, somewhere in your, in your computer. In particular, you have Sarah. So the first thing that I do is I will untar the file okay, that has created this folder. So you can go into the folder to see that there is nothing mysterious there, many files. Well, you can say that this is mysterious also. <laughs> and for example, there is a, a, a folder that I recommend you to explore a little bit, which is this folder called Models. And here you have uh, all the models that I, that I show you in the, in the slides. So for instance, the standard model is here. Uh, the minimal supersymmetric standard model is here. And you have many of them. Of course, maybe the name doesn't mean anything to you, but if you explore the model, you can understand easily what they are. Um, so for these lectures, uh, today and tomorrow, we will use uh, a model that is not distributed with the official uh, file that SARA provides in their website. I will use a model called Scotogenic. Okay? So this, this uh, model, is in this file, scotogenic.tar.dc, that is also in the website. You have downloaded it already, I guess, and you basically have to do the same. So what I will do is I will go to SARA and then models. I will create a new folder that I will call scotogenic. Then I will move that file here and then I will untar it. Okay. And you have these files that were inside. Okay? These files correspond to the implementation of the model in SARA. This is what I will tell you, tell you today, how to implement a model in SARA. If you want to work with a model that is already implemented in SARA, you don't need to do the, 
the first part. You don't need to implement it. It's already here, so you can pass directly to the second half of this lecture, which will be the exploration of the model. Okay? But I think it's very nice to be able to implement your own model because if you are imaginative and you have a new model that nobody studied before, you can easily implement it and study its properties very easily. So there are, there are several files for the implementation of the model, but in order to understand what they mean, let me spend two, three minutes discussing the model itself. So doing some physics instead of just computers. So photogenic model, okay. Maybe some of you already know it Sorry, very well. I'm pretty sure. Sure, uh, tell me. Yeah, it's a question. So, uh, is there any problem if I uh, put this this model in another directory other than the model the models? Mm, it has to be in that directory. Oh, okay. Uh, Sarah okay. will only find the model. I mean, uh, well, actually, never tried. If you just load the model, like you will see with the command, and then the name of the model, it has to be there. Maybe there is a different alternative way to do it, but I think it's it's the only way, as far as I know. Okay. Okay. So, as I was saying, I'm pretty sure that many of you already know the model, but if not, at least we will have a common language. So the scotogenic model is sometimes called by different names. I like the, the name Scotogenic because it's pretty unique. Some people call it relative CISO, which is somehow correct, but it's also, there are many relative CISOs, so I like to use this more specific name. And this is a model that Ernest Ma proposed in 2006. Um, it's a very simple extension of the standard model. So here I'm giving you the, the lepton tablet of the standard model, the lepton singlet, and the Higgs tablet with these quantum numbers under the standard model gauge group. And you have these new guys. So you have some singlets that I denote as N, and, uh, and some second doublet, which is basically the same as phi, basically the same as the Higgs doublet in the standard model, with the same quantum numbers, apart from an additional set to symmetry under which these two guys are odd. Okay? And the rest of the particles, the standard model particles, are even. So these guys that belong to this sector with an odd charge under the set 2 are dark because you will see that in this model there will be a dark matter candidate and that explains the name of the model because in Greek, skotos means darkness okay, I didn't know that, I had to ask it because skotos means nothing to me so with these new particles you can already write some additional terms in the Lagrangian so you have, of course, a uh, kinetic term for the singlets uh, you also have a kinetic term for the scalar that I didn't write but of course you have it and, um, for example, these singlets, if they are uh, singlets, <laughs> they can have an invariant mass term in the Lagrangian, which is written here, it's a Majorana mass term, and you can have this additional Yukawa coupling with the standard model uh, doublet, uh, lepton doublet, okay? So this is the singlet, the lepton doublet of the standard model, and ITA is this new inner doublet uh, that we have introduced. There are also several new couplings in the scalar potential, so you have a mass for the Higgs, a mass for the ITA, and several quartic couplings, lambda 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, which are defined here. And, okay, I just copied here the potential again. So one thing that is important is that um, since this doublet here, eta, uh, contains a charged particle and a neutral particle, uh, the charged particle is just eta plus eta minus, but for the uh, neutral particle, it is very convenient to split it into the real and imaginary components. So this is what I do here. Eta R will be the uh, real component and eta I the imaginary one. I will assume CP conservation, okay? So everything will be real in this discussion to make it simpler. You don't need to do that. You can do it with uh, complex variables in, in SARA. There is no problem. But just for the for simplicity, I will assume that CP is concerned that everything is real. Uh, sorry. So um, you can easily calculate the masses for these particles here, just using the definition that I gave you in the potential, and you get this. So um, and one thing that I would like to to basically point out is that these two guys, this component here and this component here, they are almost degenerate. The only difference in their mass is proportional to lambda phi. So to this coupling here, that I, as you will see in a moment, will be assumed to be very small. 
So since this coupling is very small, these two masses will be very close, very, very close. Keep that in mind because that will appear later. Okay, one of the things why this model is interesting is because it generates neutrino masses, but not at three level, okay? The reason why you don't have neutrino masses at three level is because of the set two symmetry. So we are assuming that eta, the, the inner tablet, doesn't get a burst, and because of that, it does not produce a Dirac mass term for the neutrinos. However, you generate neutrino masses at the one loop level by a diagram like this. And this coupling over here is lambda five. So you will see that uh, in this model, neutrino masses can proportional to lambda five, and because of that, uh, I want to have lambda fives as small as possible, because that allows me to have large coupling, for example, in this vertex and this vertex, and still have small neutrino masses. Okay? There are many variations of this idea, so I give you here a reference. But this scotogenic idea has been used a lot in the, in the last few years, in the last decade, basically. And the other nice property of this model is that you have dark matter. So since this set two symmetry is completely uh, conserved, the lightest particle that is odd under set two is stable. And there are two possibilities depending on the mass uh, hierarchy. If the lightest guy is the fermion, let's say N1, uh, we have fermionic dark matter. And this is, uh, in my opinion, very interesting because this guy doesn't have gauge interaction. So it can only be produced in the early universe by the Yukawa. And this has very nice properties. And the second possibility is that you have a light scalar, and in that case, you have scalar dark matter, which can be uh, basically the real or the imaginary component of eta C. And this has a completely different phenomenology. And I think that's all you need to know about the Scott engineering model at the moment to have a, an overview. So let me now uh, go back to the to Sara and to and to the implementation of the model. If you have any question about the model, you can also ask me. Eh? It's, it's, I think some of you are already very familiar with it, mm -hmm. but I need to introduce it a little bit. So I will start with this scotogenic plot M file. Okay, this is the main file for the implementation of the model in SAR. Okay, so I will now make it a bit bigger. I think I can do it like this. No, it's, it's okay. So let me go through the file and you will see that basically all the information that is provided can be easily related to what I already told you. So first, the beginning of the file is just some basic information about the model. So you have to give it a name. Uh, maybe you want to give it a fancier name that will be later shown in a LaTeX file. You have to, if you want, give the authors of the model and the date when it was built. Since this is a mathematical file, you can write comments using this uh, trick that you probably know very well in Mathematica. So use this bracket and asterisk, asterisk bracket and everything inside is a comment. So you can write any comment, for example, oh, I forgot to include this particle, I have to do it tomorrow. Okay, so this is very, very easy. The next thing you do is to define what are the symmetries of the model. So first you have this global symmetries of the model. In this model, you only have the set to symmetry. So you say that your first global symmetry um, is a set to symmetry. Okay, This is what you say here. And the name that you give to the symmetry is set to. But you can also write here, I don't know, my symmetry. It is just the name. Okay, Set two is maybe more convenient. And then you have also to define what are the gauge groups in your model. So this is just a standard model gate symmetry. So you have to give the three groups that you have in your symmetry. So the notation is more or less easy, but let me explain. So for each symmetry, you have to give the name of the gauge boson. So for U1, this is B. The type of symmetry, U1. A name for the symmetry, so hypercharge. The name for the gauge coupling, G1. And then you have two additional entries. False and one. I will explain this. So one is the charge of this group, or to be more precise, the charge of the gauge bosons under the global symmetry. Mm -hmm. So if we didn't have a global symmetry, this can be removed. Okay? If we didn't have a global symmetry, this would be enough. But since we have a global symmetry, we have to give a, a charge for these gauge bosons under the global symmetry. 
since in this case it's just plus one, so they are even, so we write one. Otherwise, we could have written minus one, which is not the case. Okay, Avelina, I have one question. So, so this global yes. one, the very first one, so do you also have predefined um, global symmetries, like global two, global three, they mean Z3, Z4 symmetries? What do they mean? Yes, as many as you want. So you can repeat this line many times. For example, you could say, I have a second global symmetry, which is not set two, but I don't know, are you one? You want global? Mm -hmm. And you call it my global. I don't know. I see. I see. You would have to add here what are the charges of this. Okay, I see, I see, I see, I see, I see, I got it. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty, you can extend it in many different ways. Mm -hmm. Okay, good question. Also, you can have additional gauge proofs. I mean, it's the sky's the limit, basically. <laughs> okay, so the last thing that I have to explain about these uh, lines is this false and true. And this is um, a matter of, uh, it's a uh, practical issue. So, typically, when you write your Lagrangian, you want to expand at some point in S2 indices. For example, if you have neutrinos and charged uh, leptons, uh, you want to see them split in your analytical expressions. You don't want to see only the tablet, but you want to split the expressions. However, you don't want to do the same thing for the different colors that are contained in an issue three triplet, for example. If you have a quark, a quark, for example, uh, you know that this is a triplet of colors, so it actually it is it contains three three states. But you don't want to extend, to expand all your, all your uh, analytical expressions in terms of the three individual colors, because then that would make all the expressions very lengthy. So this is the meaning of this false and true. True means please expand, false means do not expand, because I don't want to see all the details of the expansion in terms of SU3 indices. Okay? In the case of U1, this is just, it, it means nothing, because you know that there is no expansion. Okay, so you can also write here true and nothing will change. But for the case of SU2, SU3 and in general any SUM, you need to say whether you want it true or false and whether to expand in different indices or not. Okay. Okay, we have defined the symmetries. Next, we have to define the matter fields. Yes. Uh, this uh, true or false has anything to do uh, whether the symmetry is broken Good point. So, um, yes and no. So, if the symmetry is unbroken, you can expand anyway. So, you can write the Lagrangian in terms of the three different colors, for example. However, if the symmetry is unbroken, uh, you know that the, the, the Lagrangian will be exactly the same for the three colors. So it will be just the sum of three Lagrangians which are exactly the same. When the symmetry is broken, that is no longer the case. So it makes more sense to want to expand in that case than in the unbroken case. But you can do it in, in both cases if you want. It's just not very practical to do it when the symmetry is unbroken. So let's say I had uh, another U1. Mm -hmm. It would be better to put it as true or false. Well, with U1 there is no difference, no? Because so you charge... Oh, yeah. There are no multiplets, but it's one dimensional. But for example, imagine you have another symmetry, I don't know, SU4, and you have a fourplet. And SU4 gets broken at some high energy scale, and then you are interested in, in looking at the different couplings for the four different elements in the fourplet. Then I would say you have to write true, because that way you can see the, the expansion of the four different terms. Mm -hmm. It's a practical issue. So internally, Stara will do the calculations always with all the indices. So with uh, without expanding. So internally, it will be without expanding. It's just the way it is shown on the screen and on the output files. Okay. Okay. So let me move to the to the matter fields. These are given here. So for each of them. You have first to decide whether there is a, it's a fermion of a scalar. So first, in this file, we have the fermion fields, and then we have the scalar fields. You have, a, you have to give a name to the multiplet. For example, in the first line, we have the quark tablet of the standard model. 
So Q is the name for the tablet. Next, you have to say uh, how many copies of it you have. In this case, we have three copies. This is the number of families, three. Then, uh, and this is important, since you have decided in this line, in this line over here, that you want to expand in SU2 indices, you have to give a name for each of the SU2 components. So since this is a doublet of SU2, you have to give a name for the first component, which is the up left quark, and another name for the down quark left, okay? This is just name it, so it doesn't mean anything. You could also write here whatever you want. But the name that you have decided here is UL and the L. And then next, you have to give the charges under the three gauge groups and the global group. So under U1 hyper charges 1 over 6, it's a doublet of SU2, it's a triplet of SU3, and it's plus 1 under Z2. And that's it. You have defined the first doublet in this way. So to make it a little bit more visual, I have this, this slide here, okay? Ah, for some reason, there are no brackets here that they should be, okay? Look at the file later, you will see that there are some brackets here. Anyway, so this is what we did. So the core tablet is defined as Q, the, the first component is U left, the second component is D left. We have three generations, these are the charges under the different gauge groups, and this is the charge under set two. I think it's pretty easy. Okay, so in that case, then have you have e, uh, this U and D, uh, they'll run from one to three. That's what you mean? Sorry, can you say that again? So this U and D, they'll have indices that will run from one to three? You mean flavor or color indices? The, no, the flavor. Flavor, yes, exactly. Ah, okay, I see. A, a, a flavor uh, index. Uh, okay, I see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, so this is what I wanted to to visualize more easily. And basically, you have a repetition of basically this rule for all the other fields. So, for example, in the second line, we have the lepton doublet. Again, three copies. We call the neutrino, we call it V left, and the charge lepton E left, with these charges under the different symmetries. The same for the down core, for the up core, for the charge lepton, and also for the new singlet that we have added in the scotogenic model. You see that in this singlet, we have minus one. This is because this is odd under set two. And now, one very important thing that sometimes confuses people. You can see that for the right-handed fields, we have written this conch and then a name. Okay. This is not required. You can write here whatever you want. So you can write here, I love Brazil. <laughs> okay, it's okay. It's just the name for this particle. Okay, there is no, it's not important. However, you should know that in SARA, all the fields have to be defined as left-handed. All the fermion fields, they have to be left-handed. So this is a way to remember, this is a memory trick that what you have defined here as D is actually the conjugate or your typical right-handed down quark. It's not the down quark, because the down quark is right-handed, the singlet is right-handed, but it's the conjugate field, because it has to be made left-handed. And because of that, it's not a triplet, but an anti-triplet of SU3. And also because of that, the hypercharge is not minus one-third, but one-third, okay? So this is just a name, but it's good to have a name, this is my advice, that uh, makes it easier for you to remember that this is the conjugate field of a right-handed, to make it left-handed. I don't know if this is clear, because it might be... Yeah, it's clear, it's clear. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. So, Adolino, uh, this code is not, not... It's not a command. Uh, it, it is not an operator, mm -hmm. it's just a label. Mm -hmm. It's a label, exactly, it's a label. So for you to remember that this is a, a left-handed field. Okay. Okay. Brackets. Uh, you mean these ones or these yes. ones? Yes. Both. Ah, no, these have to be there. These have to be there because this is, since you are saying that this is a tablet, you have to uh, enclose the two components into the brackets. This is important. Mm -hmm. that's, 
That's why I was saying that here, for some reason, I don't know, they don't appear here. So this is a typo. There should be brackets here. Okay. So this is the only tricky thing about implementing the model, actually. The rest is very easy. So you have to remember that all the fermions have to be left-handed. Avelino, in order to assign the charges, we need to follow the same sequence as we put in the gauge, in the, in the symmetries, the gauge symmetries yes. in the global? Yes, very good question, yes. So the first number corresponds to the first gauge group. Second number, second gauge group, third number, third gauge group, and then you continue with all the gauge groups, and then you begin with the global symmetries. So the first global symmetry, the second, the third, you may have as many as you want. All right, thanks. Mm -hmm. Good questions, very good. Okay, and, and you do the same with the scalars. You see that the scalars is exactly the same. So this is the Higgs doublet. So you have H is the number of the doublet. You have only one copy. You don't have more than one in this model. This is the names that you give for the components. And these are the charges and the decimetries. And that's it. And also do, you do the same for eta. Okay, this is eta. So, name for the eta plus, eta zero, around the charges, and again, this has minus one under the set two. Apart from that, the rest is the same. Okay, so we have defined all the particles in the model. Now we have to define the Lagrangian. Okay, I will skip this line because this is always there, and it's a technical detail, you don't have to remove it. <laughs> but this is the definition of the Lagrangian. Okay, so. This block over here is what defines the Lagrangian. So, for practical reasons, my recommendation is that you define the Lagrangian in several pieces, as I did here. And then, here in this block, you basically say that all these pieces, okay, so lag fair, lag mp, lag h, and so on, for each of them, you have to decide whether you want to add plus emission conjugate or not. Okay? This is because you know that in some cases, when you have a term that is not emission, you have to add plus emission conjugate to make the Lagrangian uh, emission. But in some cases, your term is already emission, so you don't have to add the second term. Mm -hmm. So this is what you do here. For example, let's begin with a very simple term. So uh, let me see which one. This one here. So lag H, this is the Lagrangian for the, for the Higgs boson. So, for example, you have uh, some coupling that I define as MH2, which is the mass of the Higgs square, times conjugate Higgs, Higgs. So this means Higgs, Higgs dagger, Higgs. And you know that this is already emission. So for this reason, this lag H here, I say add emission conjugate holes. I don't need to add the emission conjugate of this term. And the same thing happened with this term over here. Also here you have the, the Lagrangian for the eta, which you can see that is analogous to the previous one. You have also some terms with eta and h. For example, this is lambda 3, h dagger, h, eta dagger, eta. Lambda 3 is the name of the coupling. So you can write here whatever name you want for your coupling. Now let me concentrate a little bit on this line. This is the Yukawa Lagrangian. So the, third, the, fifth, the first three terms correspond to the standard model Yukawa couplings, and the last one is the new Yukawa coupling that you have in this model. So again, to make it more visual, I did a slide, which is given here. So this Lagrangian is basically written here. Oh, sorry. So you have, for example, YV, H dagger, D bar Q. So we go to the, to the file. So YD h dagger d bar q okay uh, if you have uh, defined all your fields or your fermion fields as left-handed you don't have to do any bar or conjugate here okay this is uh, easy the reason is that internally sarah works with two component fermions i don't know if you're familiar with this notation we are usually now more commonly used to four component fermions Internally, it is using two component fermions. In any case, you can get familiar with this notation quickly, and you can see that this term corresponds to this term over here. Okay, to 
Yes, exactly. This is the definition of the term, of the Lagrangian. So, for example, uh, if you don't like this name, you can call it, I don't know, YB with, without capital Y, or you can call it, again, I don't know, BB, because you know, you like that capital more, that name. It's just the name. Okay, I will keep the, the standard name for practical reasons, but you can change it if you want. Okay, and this way you define the complete Lagrangian. You don't need to introduce kinetic terms because they will be assumed to be canonical. So there is no need to define the way these, these guys have their kinetic terms. And that defines the Lagrangian. With this, you have the complete Lagrangian already. Okay? Um, also, well, uh, you have all the freedom here. As, as you can see, I split the Lagrangian in five pieces, but you can do it in one piece. Well, one piece maybe is not very convenient, but maybe you can do it in two pieces, three pieces, as many as you want. Okay? For each piece, you add a new line here, and you say whether you have to add the three you to it or not. And that's okay. Also, you can put the sign with a minor, without a minor. It's just a convention. You have control over that. There is no, no limitation for that. Okay. Let me continue. The next thing you have to do is you have to define your gate sector. And this is also more or less intuitive. So you have two lines. The first line is for the neutral gauge bosons. The second line is for the charge gauge bosons. So you see that here you are sending this gauge boson and this gauge boson, they mix into this gauge boson and this gauge boson, and their mixing vectors will be called like this. So let me go more slowly because I know this is maybe too fast. So VB is the name for the gauge boson of the U1 field, the U1 uh, gauge group. So you see this B, so B here becomes VB, so the vector of the B, okay, if you want. And also here you have the third component of VWB. And WB is the gauge boson for SU2. So this is nothing but the mixing between the B boson and W3, that you know very well in the standard model. Okay, so, the, so, okay so the, the V the V means really something there, or, 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 or it's just a label? It, it's a label, but it's a label that you have to put. Ah, okay, so you have to put, okay. This is a relic from original versions of Sarah, from the first versions. Okay. So mm -hmm. this is because originally this was thought for supersymmetry only. So for each particle you have always for vector and fermion, or fermion and scalar. So basically you are saying you want to pick up the vector. And then even though you are not doing supersymmetry, the notation has somehow survived. Okay, I see. Mm -hmm. So uh, this okay. is the vector. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in this case, it's a vector. In, uh, for example, I have a scalar uh, pseudo vector. For example, and yes. I I I not write B. Yes. So what you are saying is that you can also have mixing among scalars, no? Or yeah. Scalars mm -hmm, yeah. Or whatever. In that case, we will see it later. So there are other things you can do. So this is only for the gauge bosons. But if you have all the mixings, you have to define all the mixings later. Okay, so so for instance, this mixing they will arise from the kinetic terms of the scalar, of the scalar. But you did not include them, so that automatically includes the kinetic terms of the of the field. Yes. So it will assume that they are canonical. Okay, and then already computes the mass mixing between these. So it will write things. the standard canonical term with the covariant derivatives. Mm, I see. Okay, so this is so, sort of a, a a way of to make sure that Sara uh, knows that these vector bosons will mix. Exactly, exactly, that's what it is. Exactly. Okay, okay, I see. So Sara is, I mean, it's very nice, but it's not super clever. So mm -hmm. you have to tell Sara that there will be some mixings. I see, I see. Mm -hmm. and, and this is the way you say it for this particular case. 
So if you make if you miss one of these mixings, so it, it gets screwed up the the mass matrices for these gauge bosons. Yes. <laughs> okay. You will see uh, the last day we will discuss a less trivial model which has a, a set prime, and you will see that we have to add it here. Otherwise, the set prime doesn't have a mass mm -hmm. directly because it doesn't affect anyone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's important. Yes. Okay. Uh, so, so in the case where we have a uh, kinetic mixing, for example, how we can implement this in, in SARA? This is a. Uh, I don't very, know. Very good question. Very yeah. good question. So, you are thinking about having two new ones, for example, no? And then they. Yes, in this case. Yes. So, this will always be there by default. So, if you have a model with two new ones, Sarah, you don't need to specify that you have kinetic mixing. We'll assume that you have it. And you will see that uh, on Friday. <laughs> wow. Okay. We'll have a moment with two right. new ones, and you will, you will see that this kinetic mixing is there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, but then but so you can, you con it. can you control the, 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 I mean, the epsilon parameter in front of the kinetic mixing then? Uh, not with Sarah. Sarah, that's just gives you analytical expression, so you get this epsilon. It will not be epsilon, but something related to epsilon, okay? But when you do numerical calculations, you can give a value. You can put it to zero if you want. Oh, okay, I see. Or, or to very small numbers, if you prefer, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so, very good questions, eh, by the way. Very good questions. <laughs> So this is the definition of the mixing for the neutral gauge bosons, and this is the definition for the charged gauge bosons. So you have the first and second components of the W boson, they mix to become the W plus and the conjugate of W plus, W minus, okay? And you give a definition for the mixing matrix, this is just a label, a name, okay? And that's it. The next thing you have to do is you have to uh, specify the way the symmetries get broken. So you have to define the vacuum expectation values of the scalars. So by default, whatever you don't include here, it's assumed not to have a vacuum expectation value. So if you have many scalars in, you, in your model and you don't write them here, okay. <laughs> if you have many scalars in your model and you don't include them here, that means that they have zero vacuum expectation value. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. Um, However, it may be that even though you have a field with a zero vacuum expectation value, you want to split it into real and imaginary components, as we did with the scotogenic model. Mm -hmm. And then you do something like this. So you, you say that the best is zero, the vacuum expectation value is zero, but you can split it into the real component, which is here, with a prefactor 1 over the square root of 2, and the imaginary component with a prefactor i divided by the square root of 2 and you give two different names to, to, to these two components. This is the second line. The first line is uh, H0, which, by the way, these two names, I, I don't define them here. They were already defined here when I defined the doublets, the H doublet and the eta doublet. So what I'm saying here is that the neutral components of these two doublets, they get BEVs. The second bev is 0, but the first one is called V divided by square root of 2. Then the real component will be called H, and the imaginary component will be called AH. So these are labels, these are, these are labels, they are defined here for the real and imaginary components of H0, and also for the real and imaginary components of eta0. Okay? And again, let me show you what I mean here. So mm. what I'm doing is nothing but this. So I'm saying that H0 will be decomposed in this way. A BEV plus a real field plus I, an imaginary field. Sorry, imaginary, imaginary component. This is also a real field. And I use this normalization, 1 over the square root of 2. And for eta 0, I do the same, but without a verb. It's just a decomposition into real and imaginary components. Okay, this is what I'm doing in this line over here. Nothing else. And this has introduced a new parameter, which is B. So every time you see B from now on, you know that this is the verb of H0. Com standard notation, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, we are almost done with this file. Uh, next, you define the mixings. 
in this model you don't have mixes between, among scalars because these scalars do not mix among them because of the Z2 symmetry. So the components of eta0 do not mix with the components of H0 because the Z2 symmetry forbids that. However, you have mixes between fermions, okay? So for example, uh, in the first two lines, you are saying that the neutrinos uh, mix among themselves. So for example, in the first line, you are saying this conch NR, this is what you wrote here. So what you are saying is that the nth singlets, they mix, and the new uh, mass eigenstate will be defined as X0, and the mixing matrix will be called ZX. These, again, are labels. These are up to you. You can define them as you want. You are just saying that these guys mix. And this is the name for the mass eigenstates. This is for the mixing matrix. That's it. Same thing for the neutrinos. They mix. The mass eigenstates will, will be called VL, with capital letters. And this will be the mixing matrix. It's just a definition. And next, you do the same thing, but for these fermions, which are Dirac fermions. So the notation is slightly different. So since these were Majorana fermions, they mix with themselves. But for the Dirac fermions, you have to define different, uh, let me use here some uh, uh, back language. So you have to define the mass eigenstates for the left fermions and for the right fermions. So here you are saying that, for example, for the long works, that the DL goes to capital DL VD, so capital DL using a mixing matrix called DD, and DR goes to capital DR with a mixing matrix called UD. So you are defining here the relation between the gauge eigenstates and the mass eigenstates. Um, Pavlina? Yes? I, I have a question. What if we have a model like the type 1 seesaw, where the right-handed neutrinos, they also mix with the left-handed neutrinos? Where, how can I put this input in this definition? Very good question. In that case, you do this. And that's it. Mm, right. You remove this part, you would remove this part because this doesn't exist anymore. You are saying that now all these guys mix together. Mm -hmm. So in this model, in this in the scotogenic model, they don't mix because of the set two symmetry. And because of that, I have to define them in two different lines, like this. But in the model you refer to, in the type 1 CISO, they mix, as you said, correctly, and then you have to put them in the same line. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's more or less intuitive when you play a little bit. So, but of course, it's a little bit uh, tricky because the notation, of course, if it is the first time you see it, it might be a little bit confusing you know, to see all these brackets and so on. But it's always the same. So for fermions, which are of Majorana type, so they mix with themselves, you just do something like this, very simple. And for Dirac fermions, you have to define independently left and right handed. So this is what we do here. Uh, one thing that I forgot to mention at the beginning is you should never implement a model from scratch because then it is super probable, super likely that you will make a type at some point because there are so many brackets, so many things. Maybe you forget here a bracket and then nothing works. Okay? So my recommendation, of course you can do it, you can write it from scratch. But my recommendation is that every time you want to implement a model, you can take one of the existing models in the official version of, uh, of SARA, for example, the standard model, this would be the, the typical choice, and you add to the standard model your new elements. You don't need to, and if you open the standard model file, you will see that these lines are already there, because these, these guys are also in the standard model. So my recommendation is always you edit files rather than write them from scratch, okay? That is the simplest way to make as few mistakes as possible. There will be mistakes, of course, we are okay, but less likely. So, Valino, just okay. to, to, uh, could you remind me again? So, in the very first slide, go up a bit. Yeah, so that one, that you have conch, uh, nr, and then x0, zx. So, this, this, yes. the last bracket, what does it mean again? So, the left bracket is the gauge iron state. Mm -hmm. This is the mass eigenstate, and this is the mixing matrix. So the relation between these two sets of states. Okay, I see, I see. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, okay, I, 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 can, I can read these brackets. Yeah, okay, I see. Okay, mm-hmm. They're so in the same set. So, you're defining here the notations, not from mm -hmm. gauge to mass eigenstates. Mm-hmm, okay. Mm -hmm. So, you're defining here the and the last part is to define the, the direct spinos. So in the end, even though everything is done internally, as I said before, with two component spinors, it is important to define what is your definition for the direct spinors, so four component spinors. So this part actually is also a relic. You don't need to modify anything in this part. You just have to concentrate on this. So for the direct spinors of the mass eigenstates. So you see now, for example, that, for example, for the downworks, you have here this line, and you have said that the mass eigenstates are capital D L and capital D R, and here in this line we are saying that your four component spinner will be made by putting together these two things, so down left and down right with a conjugate. Same thing for the charged leptons, same thing for the upworks, and for the neutrinos the normal neutrinos and the new singlet neutrinos, since these are major and fermions, the same guy that appears here, appears here. These are self-conjugate for component spinners. And that's it. And your model is defined already. There is nothing else. Mm -hmm. If you have a complicated model, writing this file is tricky. <laughs> okay? <laughs> if you have a not so complicated model, it's more or less easy. When you have experience, you can write this file maybe in 15 minutes because you just have to add the new elements. So if you have two new particles, maybe you can do it in two minutes. If you have more things like a new gauge group, additional global symmetries, then you have to give more information. But it's always the same. So you have to define the symmetries, you have to define the fields, then your Lagrangian, and then verbs and mixes between uh, Cage bosons, scalars, in this case there are no scalar mixes, but if there were scalar mixes, they will be here as well. And the, the Dirac spinners. And that's it. With that, you have to define your model. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, I will now move on to the other files, even though I don't want to spend uh, too much time with them, because otherwise this will be a very long lecture. So. There are, uh, well, let me remove this file which I just created. So there are these other files, parameters.m and particles.m. These are uh, additional optional definitions, okay? So they are not actually required to give more information to Sarah. One of the files, particles.m, is information about the particles. And the other file, parameters.m, is information about the parameters of the model. In both cases, there are some global files. What I mean by global files? So if I go just one level up to the main model folder, you see already that there are two files, parameters.m and particles.m. These are global definitions for particles and parameters, which are present in many models. Example, so you don't need to define the set boson for your model, because the set boson is already in the standard model. So you can use the definition that is already in the global file. You will see how you do that in a moment. Also, you don't need to define everything for the, I don't know, the G-strong gauge coupling, for the gauge coupling for the strong interactions, because that coupling is already present in the standard model. So somebody did that definition already. So you can inherit that definition, which is in this file, in parameter.m, okay? So typically what you do in this uh, additional two files in your particular model is you add information about the new stuff in your model, for example, let me open particles.m and I will try to be brief because I know that otherwise it will get very long. So it's more or less short, okay? Well, I don't know. <laughs> there is some information in this file and it's split into different parts. First, you have information about gauge eigenstates. Then you have some information about uh, what it's called here, electroweak symmetry breaking eigenstates or mass eigenstates, more commonly expressed. And finally, there are some intermediate eigenstates, or intermediate states, sorry, okay? Typically, as I said, all what I'm gonna say now is optional. Typically, you don't need to do this, but in some cases you may. For example, here you see that, for example, we have defined 
uh, not here, sorry, here. We have defined this. This was not in the standard model because this is the real component of the data field. And we are giving some information about this field. For example, this description is just a human name for you to remember what this guy is. So you can write whatever you want here. It's just a description for you to understand what you're doing. Now, if you want to use Sarah to create input files for math graphs, you need each particle in your model to have a PDG code. So you need to define the PDG code for this particle. And here I use this number, which I particularly like. Okay, but you can use any number. Just make sure that you don't, you don't use a number that is already taken for a different particle. Now you have this mass, which basically tells uh, Sarah in case it has to produce files for MathGraph again, how the mass of these particles is going to be passed to MathGraph. So in this case, it is said that the mass will be given in the format of a Lesus file that you will see tomorrow. So don't worry about this at the moment. But again, this line is only important if you want to use Sarah in combination with MathGraph. Otherwise, it's not relevant. The same thing exactly with electric charge. So this guy is a, is a neutral scalar, so you say electric charge zero. If you don't say anything, nothing changes. But it might be important, for example, if you want to use it with MathGraph again, because MathGraph needs to know the electric charge of this particle. And finally, there is this line, ITAR, sorry, uh, LATEC, which uh, you will see later today. If you want to produce a very beautiful LATEC output for your model, you need to say how this guy will be written in LATEC. If you don't add this line, it will be written just like this, which might not be very beautiful. So see, E, E, R, instead of a beautiful E, uh, R, okay? And finally, there is this output name, which is just a name that is used uh, in output files. So all this information is optional. If you don't put this information, you can already start working with the, with the model. But if you put it, you have additional things in case you want to pass information to other codes, as I was explaining before, or to produce not a um, In many cases, you don't need to do this, as I told you already. For example, see this line. This is the definition of the photon. Now, the photon is present already in the standard model, so you don't need to define anything. You just say description photon, and then it goes to the general file that I showed you before, this global file particles.m that is in the main model, uh, models folder and it takes all the definitions for the particle that in that file is called photon so this name here refers to that file one more thing that might be important is that in some cases for example in this line when you are defining a, a massive gauge boson so this is not the case for the photon but it is the case for the set boson you have to define where to take the goldstone boson from so you know that the set boson in the standard model gets its mass after electroweak symmetry breaking because you typically say it eats up the imaginary component of the Higgs field. So this is the constant boson in that model and it's called AH in the, uh, in the main model file that we had defined before. So you may remember probably that the imaginary component of H0 was called AH. And, and that's it. I mean, you can look a little bit at this file uh, you may see that there are other options other additional pieces of information that you can give for these particles but as i said all of them are optional so i don't want to spend more time with them uh Valino, uh yes question. Uh, if there is mixing in the scalar sector uh, the goldstone bosons will be combinations of the scalars so you have to take into account this mixing uh, to define this goldstone boson for the gauge bosons? Um, yes and no. So this will be shown uh, explicitly on Friday, because in that model there will be exactly what you just said. So you just have to say uh, for the mass components, so after you go to the diagonal basis, uh, which one goes to each gauge boson. For example, you say the first, the lightest, lightest meaning nothing because they are degenerate, they are all massless. But the first one will go to this gauge boson, for example, to the set. And the second one will go to the set prime. This is what you do. Okay. You don't need to say how is the mixing between them. This will be calculated automatically by Sarah. 
Okay. You will see that explicitly on Friday. Uh -huh. Okay. Oh. Now let me just show you very quickly this parameters file because it's basically the same. So this is again extra definition that you can give for some of the parameters. So when you see that you just have this description, it's because again you are you are referring to the global file, to the global parameter.m file that you have in the model folder. But for some parameter, for example, for this parameter, this is m eta square. This is a scalar term. This is the, the coefficient of the eta dagger eta term in the scalar potential. So you are defining here uh, in the first line how to print this, this parameter when you write LaTeX. Okay? Maybe you have noticed that you have always slash slash. This is important. This is because in, in Mathematica, uh, only one slash is dangerous. So everything in, in SARTA, when you write LaTeX code, you have to use twice as many slashes as usual. Okay, every time you have to make it twice. You see it everywhere. Okay, you just have to remember that. There is also an output name, which again, this is the name of this parameter in output files. And in this case, there is also an option that is important. So this is basically the way you have to tell Sarah uh, when it produces an output file, uh, this output file is in a format that is called Lesures. You will see that tomorrow. Uh, in this format, the parameters are uh, split into different blocks. And each block has a name and different labels. So basically what you're saying here is that this parameter will be printed in a plot in a block, sorry, that is called HTM with label one. Lambda one, for example, will be in the same block but with label two. So you will see a file with a name uh, HTM on top of it and then one, two, three, four, and next to it, a number. That is the numerical value that that parameter has. And you know that one goes to this parameter, two goes to this parameter, and so on, okay? So you are defining here things that will be necessary tomorrow when we see how to do numerical calculations. That's because that's why I was saying that this is, again, optional. If you don't want to do numerical calculations, you can skip this. There is no need for this, okay? You can also say that some parameters are real, because if this parameter is real, then all the analytical expressions will look nicer because you don't have lambda 5 and lambda 5 star, but you just have lambda 5 and so on. Okay? And there are many parameters that you can define. Okay? If you don't have questions about this, I am done explaining how to implement the model. There are two additional files. Um, this file is fino.m. Uh, is the file that you have to provide if you want to create a Sphino code for this model. And this I will describe tomorrow. And this other file, leshoes.in.scotogenic uh, file, this is um, uh, actually, this is not part of the implementation, but this is an example parameter point that I put here because I will use it tomorrow. So I don't need to explain this today and this today. I think this will be described tomorrow. So if you don't have any question or comment, I will start playing with Sarah. So, so far we have only implemented the model. We haven't done anything. So, so far it's only work. Now we have to take profit of Sarah. We have to take advantage. Okay, so any questions or comments? No. No? Okay, then let's play with Sarah. And for this, um, I also, okay, maybe I will open another one. So I send you also, well, I didn't send you. I, I gave you this Mathematica notebook that you can also find in the website. This Mathematica notebook is already prepared to do the things that I'm going to do now. Okay. Oops, I don't know why this doesn't go away. Okay. So let me make it a bit bigger so you can see better. Maybe too big. <laughs> Okay, like this. So the first thing you do is to load the package, which you do with this command. It's a normal command to load a package in Mathematica. Okay, it loads the package. It takes just uh, one second, less than a second, very quickly. So Sarah is already loaded. The next thing is you load the model you want to work with. In this case, we want to work with the scotogenic model. And here, and this was a question that I got before. If the model is in the models folder, you just have to write the name of the folder. 
since in our case it was scotogenic, we just have to say start scotogenic. And then it immediately starts computing things for this particular mode. Okay? It's finished, so it took only five seconds, 5.3 seconds. For complicated models, it may take up to several minutes. So if a very complicated model is loaded in SARA, it has to compute all the Lagrangian terms and many other things, this could be more lengthy. But for simple models, it's just a matter of a few seconds. So you see that what SARA has done is it has loaded the files and it does many operations. For example, it checks that gauge anomalies cancel out. This is super important, as you know. If for some reason, gauge anomalies don't cancel out, you get a message here. Like, warning, warning, there is an anomaly that is not canceled. So your model might be already in problems. It derives the Lagrangian, it calculates all the uh, terms in your Yukawa and potential, Yukawa Lagrangian and potential, many other things. It calculates also how to go from the gauge eigenstates to the mass eigenstates, many things. You don't have to read this, it's just done internally by Sarah. And now you are ready to explore the model. For example, one of the first things that you might want to do is to see what is the mass matrix for your chart lectures. So you use this command, mass matrix, and here, Fe, this, I close the file, so let me open it for you. I have it here, up here. So, oh, sorry. So Fe is the name that I gave to this Dirac spinner, so the chart left of Dirac spinner. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you say, I want the mass matrix for this guy. You do enter and you get this right away. So you see that this mass matrix comes proportional to some Yukawa terms, Ye, times V divided by square root of 2. So very simple, no? Basically, this is what you got. This is the expression for the mass matrix for the chart vectors. Okay? It doesn't look very nice, maybe, because you have this minus T squared divided by root of 2 that you can put in front of it as a global factor, but this is the result, okay? You can now do other things, for example, you can say simplify uh, what I just calculated. Okay, it doesn't do anything, I was expecting this to get a global factor, but okay. You see that you can do many things already, or I don't know, multiply by two. You can say, I want to multiply by two, and you get a, you can, so you can operate with the analytical spaces already. You can also calculate the mass matrix for, for the new guys. This guy refers to, again, this Dirac spinner, okay? And if you do that, you get this expression. It looks a bit funny because you get something like MN11, but in the 1, 2 element, you get 1, 2 plus 2, 1, with a, square, with a 1 over 2 in front of it. Why is that? Because this matrix is symmetric, and Sarah didn't know that. So if you simplify the matrix by imposing, this is what I have in this line, that it's symmetric, that 2, 1 is equal to 1, 2, then you get this, which is basically the, the mass matrix for the singlets, which is nothing but the MN term in the, in the Lagrangian. So this is what I did. Okay. This is what I did. So from this, I pass to this, just by saying that these two guys are the same. And also these two guys, and also these two guys. So very simple analytical calculations that you can do. Um, and you can also calculate, for example, the mass of the Higgs boson. In this case, you don't have to use mass matrix because this guy doesn't meet with anyone. So it doesn't have a mass matrix, but it has just mass. So you have to, do, to use this syntaxis here. And when you do that, you get this. So the mass of the Higgs boson is three times lambda one t squared divided by two minus mh squared. This is the analytical expression. Okay, that's it, nothing. But you see, I mean, these calculations already might take some time in some models to do this calculation by hand. And, but, and Sarah gave them just right away after loading the model. Now you want to calculate the tuple equation, so the minimization of the scalar potential. Okay. This you can do in different ways. For example, you can use this command, tuple equations electroweak symmetry breaking, and you get this. This gives you the two equations. So the equation for the first bell mm -hmm. and the equation for the second bell. Since the second bell is zero, the equation is trivially zero equal to zero. So you don't get any information. But the first equation that you can also write 
specifically like this, is the minimization of the scalar potential that you have in this model, which is exactly the same as in the standard model. And now you can do one thing. So we calculated before here the mass of the Higgs boson, right? You can use this minimization condition and replace, for example, MH2 by the expression that you get by solving this equation. So the solution to the Tadpole equation is this. MH2 is given by this uh, quantity here, and you can replace this quantity back into the calculation of the Higgs boson mass. And you get lambda 1 d squared, which is the very well-known result in the standard model. Okay, so again, the Tadpole equations are obtained like this. This is the Tadpole equation for the Higgs BF, which you solve to get this expression. And when you apply this expression into the Higgs boson mass, you get this very well-known result. This is the Higgs boson mass in the standard model and also in the scotogenic model, they are the same. Now it may be that this is very simple. So let's go to something a bit more complicated. Now I want to calculate vertices. This is, at least it was for me when I was doing my PhD, this is where I was spending most of my time, calculating analytically very complicated vertices with many particles, and I have to calculate all the vertices with the mixing methods and so on. Now let's see how to do that with Sarah. So the first thing that I want to do is I want to calculate a charge lepton bar, charge lepton Higgs, very simple vertex. And I do that with this command, vertex. I get this expression. Now you might be a little bit worried. I don't understand anything. So let me go step by step and explain what this is. So the first thing here is the, the particles that uh, participate in this vertex. So you have bar Fe, Fe, HH. And for the first two guys, you have GT1, GT2. These are flavor indices. So this has to be understood as Fe of flavor GT1. It's a very bad name, sorry, but this is the way Sarah does it. Fe, GT2. Okay, so these are two flavor indices. Now, the coupling is given as the sum of two terms. The first term is this part here, and the second term is this part here. The first term corresponds to the left chirality projector, and the second term to the right chirality projector. And you see that the expression for each of these terms comes proportional to i divided by square root of 2 times uh, a sum of different Yukawas and mixing matrices with some indices. Okay? It may look complicated, but you will see that visually in a moment. In fact, I will show you this already here. So this is your result. This is what we just did. So this vertex with indices ij is the sum of these two different pieces. So the left-handed piece and the right-handed piece. You have here v and q, and you have the Yukawa. And this v and u are the rotation matrices that we define in the definition of the model. So V and U are the mixing matrices that connect the gauge eigenstates with the mass eigenstates for the charge left. Left and right handed. V goes for left, U goes for right. So in this way, Sarah has given you the complete expression for the vertex, for any flavor indices. Okay? Now I can calculate also this vertex, this is charge lepton neutrino W minus, actually charge lepton plus neutrino W minus, and you get this expression. In this case, you get again the particles that participate in the vertex, and you get two pieces, one that goes with gamma mu P left, that you can see gamma mu is, is I mean, the notation is a bit ugly, I agree with you but you get familiar with it and then you like it. So this is gamma mu times P left, and this is P right, okay? And you see that P right comes with a seal, because this coupling is purely left-handed, as you know. The W couples purely left-handed in the standard model. And the coupling is given here. And you see that you have two matrices here, V and VV. This is the matrix that goes from gauge to mass against states for the charge leptons, and this is the analogous one for the neutrinos. So what you have here is nothing but this. So the product V times V neutrino, gamma mu P left. Typically, 
the product of these two matrices is the so-called PMNS matrix. So basically, you have rediscovered the PMNS matrix uh, with Sarah. Mm -hmm. Now, you may wonder, what if I calculate a new coupling? Because these couplings, I already have them in the standard model, so I don't get anything. So I want to calculate now neutrino chi Higgs. Chi is the new singlet, okay? So this would be normal neutrino, singlet neutrino, Higgs boson. And the result is, anybody knows? Anybody wants to guess? Hmm. If I'm asking, it's because the result is zero, okay? The coupling is exactly zero because it is forbidden by the set to symmetry. So this guy is plus, this is plus, and this is minus. So this coupling is forbidden. But you can calculate it anyway, and Sarah tells you that the coupling is zero. So zero P left, zero P right. If you do the same calculation, but instead of the Higgs, the normal Higgs, you put here the inner Higgs, then you get a result that is different from zero. And it involves the rotation matrices for the neutrinos and for the singlets. And the new Yukawa coupling. Yn is the new Yukawa coupling. And this way you can calculate as many vertices as you want. Mm -hmm. You can also calculate the stupid couplings, I don't know, for example. I want to calculate um, this coupling. So neutrino, charge lepton, neutral Higgs. This violates electric charge. So, of course, I get zero. I cannot get anything else. It has to be zero because this violates electric charge. Mm -hmm. But you can also calculate uh, neutrino, neutrino with the Higgs. You get zero again. You can calculate uh, neutrino, anti-neutrino with the Higgs to get zero again. I mean, you can play with this as much as you want and calculate couplets. Okay. Mm. If you don't have any question, I will move to the next part, which will be the last one today. Yeah. So I just one thing. So you mentioned the the Higgs mass, but the Higgs mass, I mean, as far as I remember, it would be square root of two lambda v, not just lambda v. Uh, the that v uh, means well, something else. I mean, it's the. Uh, this is just a matter of convention. This is because you define your BEV here. When you define the Higgs boson BEV, you do it with a square root of 2. Mm. So mm -hmm. the Higgs BEV is not V, but V divided by square root of 2. Ah, okay, I see. Mm -hmm. And this is the origin of the mm -hmm. yeah, Higgs yeah, Okay. It's a definition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. If you change that, you can change that. Then mm -hmm. it will change as well. Okay. Okay, so, I mean, you can now calculate all vertices, all mass matrices, anything, step by step, by using these commands here, this mass matrix or this mass. Uh, you can find the total equations, you can calculate the vertices, but there is another thing that you can do. So, Sarah has this uh, command, make text, that produces a text file uh, that you can compile very easily with all the analytical information about your model. I think this is amazing. Yeah, you have that's to use quite that amazing. This. <laughs> yes, so you will see that in a moment. First, you have to use this model output command that calculates everything. Basically, model output, what it's doing is to do all these vertex for all the possible vertices in the model and all the mass matrices and everything. And putting this information into some files. Okay? It takes some minutes. I think it's two or three minutes. But I think it's a good moment if you have a question. Now it's calculated, you see. Mm -hmm. Now it's calculating two scalar, two vector boson interactions. It's going step by step to all the possible interaction vertices that you have in your model. Uh, so I, I do have one. So Avelino, can we check whether our implementation is correct or not? I mean, you just mentioned one, which was, for instance, if we have the, uh, I think you mentioned the electric charge or something. Uh, would, ah, yes, the emission, yes. the emission term, if we have or not. But so for instance, if, if I messed up and then forgot an electric charge or wrote down an Lagrangian which does not conserve electric charge, does it give me an error or, or, or what? Very, very good question. So uh, there are two ways you can do that. My personal recommendation is to print on the screen some results that you know in advance. For example, some mass matrices, uh, because typically the typical thing that, typic that, that happens is that uh, some of the charges are uh, reversed. 
So instead of plus one, you put minus one somewhere. Mm -hmm. And because of that, two guys that should mix don't mix. Mm. Uh, so by printing the match matrix, you can see it immediately because you get a zero in a place where you shouldn't have a zero. Mm, I see. Uh, but in principle, Sara has a command that is uh, check model. So I can use it here. It's check model. Uh, I think you have to use it. I don't remember the syntax. Yeah, exactly. Check model. And it does some checks also. But in my experience, sometimes you get some messages which are a bit confusing. I see. For example, sometimes it finds terms that you have not included in your in your Lagrangian that are allowed by ultimate. And then it tells you, hey, this term could be in your model. Why didn't you put it? And But sometimes this is just wrong. For example, here you have this message. Possible term. Oops. Continue waiting. I don't know what I did. So you see this message. Possible terms. The following terms are not present in the potential, but allowed by gauge invariance. So this is not correct. Uh, so this term could be in principle written, but this is the mission. I don't know what it is. So, the, oh, I think I, I did something wrong. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so, so this message is telling you that this term is not the Lagrangian, but this is the mission conjugate of the one you have put in the Lagrangian. Yeah, which you already defined the way you did. So I, sometimes I don't like this command very much, but sometimes it is true that it is helpful because it tells you uh, that some mixes could in principle be there and you didn't put. For example, if you have two guys with the same quantum numbers and you didn't put them together in the mixing part, mm -hmm. it, it tells you, so, hey, why didn't you put these guys together? Maybe you didn't do it on purpose because you know there is an additional symmetry or something that you didn't specify in the model file, but it tells you. Okay. Uh, also, for example, um, so Sarah only calculates three level uh, masses for your particles at this level, okay? So it does other things in other parts of the code. And then, for example, it tells you that this guy has only zeros in their mass matrix. Mm -hmm. This is because these guys have masses at three level. Right. Okay, so it's information that you have, but sometimes it's not very useful. Okay. But my recommendation is that in addition to this, which could be useful sometimes, you play a little bit, you, you print as many things as you want, and then you, you make confident that what you did is correct. But of course, there are subtle things that may have gone wrong that you have to find by yourself. Sometimes this is tricky. <laughs> and now I think I, I aborted everything, so I think I have to load everything again, sorry. I did it because I was getting this message that I don't understand anyway. Okay. And now I think I can run this already. So I already ran this before, this model output, mm -hmm. so I can run this make tech. I have to run it again because I, okay, it's a minute and a half, okay, <laughs> not so much. For okay. some reason, I don't see now this uh, dynamic uh, content. <clears throat> I see, so so you mean, so whatever you asked previously, that's what the, uh, uh, you're going to have as a latex, in a latex format, or you have everything? Everything, you will see that. <laughs> My goodness. Everything. And it's super nice because, well, you will see that in a, in a moment. Oh, well, it's uh, good to write papers. <laughs> exactly, exactly. It's perfect for an appendix. So you can put all this information in an appendix. Like here you have all the vertices of your model both directly to the, to the appendix. Mm -hmm. And you can edit. I mean, it's very easy. Okay. You, you will see that in a moment. And with that, I think we can conclude for today. I'm sorry if it was a, a bit longer than expected. Yes, yeah, because we also asked questions during the talk, so. Yeah, and they were very good. <laughs> yeah, so for instance, one thing I should let you know is that the, uh, some of the students who are listening to this lecture were asked actually to learn SADA. So, ah. yeah, so your lecture okay, is, so. It will be very, very useful. And probably you're going to have collaborators out of this talk. Yeah, yeah, I think, I mean, there are other uh, ways to proceed, for example. I, I think that this should not replace doing calculations by hand because, as I told you before, you have you should trust in codes, uh, but only very little because sometimes they have bugs and they have errors and you have to understand what you are doing. But once you understand what you are doing, uh, it speeds up calculations very much. 
and I think that's very helpful. So it's done, so now I can use this matrix. Finished. So let me show you what happens. So now, inside the SARA folder, here, I have this folder called Outputs, okay? If I go inside, you have a new folder that we have created during this session, it's called Ogenic. Here you have this Anisotral folder, and you see this file here, this folder here, text. So I go inside, and you have all these files, all these tech files. So these tech files contain the vertices in tech format. So let me just open one of them. <laughs> My <Nice>. goodness. <laughs> That's impressive. Right. That's very impressive. Yes, yes. So you have... Uh, so this is tech format. So for example, here you have a vertex. Here you have another vertex. Okay. So actually it also comes with a file make pdf sh that compiles everything together and makes a pdf so let me do it it's now compiling it takes a, a little bit for the first time because it's compiling also some Feynman diagrams to make it more visual This file here is cryptogenic uh, PDF that we just created. So this is the file that we have created with Sarah. Okay, so this is today, and it's 60 pages long. <laughs> so we have created this file in a moment. Okay, you have some references here, and this is what you have in this file. So you have information about the fields, about the Lagrangian, the rotations. What are the verbs, the tuple equations, the particles, and all the vertices? So let me show you. For example, these are the gauge fields in your model. These, has, these are the, the fields, the matter fields. The Lagrangian, okay, sometimes it doesn't look very nice, okay? Sometimes the formatting is not very nice. But this is, here I think this is not very important. The Lagrangian, you never want to copy it from, from this file. So these are the rotations between uh, gauge and mass eigenstates. There are no scalar mixings, but there are fermion mixings. So this is the definition of the rotation matrix between the uh, original mass matrix and the diagonal mass matrix. Also for the neutrinos, for the down quarks, for the up quarks, all the definitions. This is your definition for the, the way you decompose your neutral scalars. The tuple equations. These are the particles that you have in your mass eigenstates. And now the vertices. So now you have all the vertices in your model. So these are three scalar interactions. And you have here the expression for the vertex. For all of them. So you can continue here and see all the vertices. This is ZAH. So this is the Colston. Sorry, the. Yes, the Colston. Uh, the Higgs boson and the Z boson. So this is the interaction term. Okay, I don't know. Uh, if you are curious about a particular couple, this is Higgs W plus W minus. Higgs Z Z. So you have all the expressions. Yeah. So two, ve two fermions, one vector boson. So this is a gluon coupling to a down quark and a down quark. So you have, this is gamma mu p left, gamma mu p right, with these particular couplings here. So you have G3, which is the strong coupling. This is the down quark coupling to a photon. You have all the couplings in your model automatically. Mm -hmm. So let me see if I find one that is not very trivial. Uh, for example, for example, this one. So this would be a, a normal neutrino a singlet and eta imaginary. Okay, this is a Yukawa type interaction, and this is the expression. So you have some mixing matrices times Yukawa times P left, and another combination with P right. You have also the coupling with eta plus, 
and so on and so on. And you can uh, you can see all the couplings, also uh, pure gauge couplings, that you know that these are sometimes tricky to compute. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Four scalar couplings, two scalar two gauge bosons. You have also couplings with the ghosts. They are also given. And that's it. So you get all this information right away. Uh, one thing that I didn't do, because it's a bit lengthy, it takes sometimes up to five minutes or ten minutes, um, and it's not good for the presentation, you can also calculate um, the normalization group equations up to two loops. And if you do that, it will also be written here in this in this PDF file. Um, and you can also do it here in the in Mathematica. You can see it directly in Mathematica or put it in the LaTeX file. So, mm -hmm. you see. It, there's many things you can do with, with, with Sarah. Yeah, amazing. So, any comment or question? No further comment on okay, my side. So Anyone, guys? Is basic. Yeah. Sorry? I have, I have one basic question. Yes. Um, it's because when we are in the, inside the model, Scottogenic, for example, uh, mm -hmm. we have some we have some ar uh, some archive there, and so I I want to know how the Lichus, for example, appears inside this directory. Sorry, I, I missed uh, your question. So how do they, they choose what? Sorry. Um, how the Lichus archive appears ah, in the directory? Yes. It's because uh, uh, the question basically is because I, I I don't know how to, for example, create. A new directory inside the inside the server. Okay, well that depends on your uh, on your system. If you are using Linux, you are using Linux. Yes, yes. So you go inside the the folder and you can use mkd and the name. So I used this before. And this oh, creates nice. a new folder. Nice. Okay, and then you put all the files inside. Okay, all right. So, uh, so friends, the way I did it, I was the way you have in your website, where you say you just import whatever you have to that thing. So, friends, if I just do dear this, the way you did it just now, so you create this scottogenic folder, but it's empty, right? There is nothing inside. Yes. Okay. okay, all right. So you can, yeah. friends, you could do it, friends. You could just move the the standard model files to that scottogenic, and then start changing from there exactly this is what i would do exactly okay. i see so you can say for example uh, i want a new model which is my new model okay. and then um, i copy all the files inside standard model to my new model mm -hmm. i go to my new model and i have these files i have to change the name oops sorry i change the name of this by to my new model dot m mm -hmm. and then uh, i can open it and start modifying yeah exactly okay, so mm -hmm. this is the model file for the standard model i don't mm -hmm. know you have a new field to add it here you modify mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. this is what i would do mm -hmm. okay. okay so this was my first lecture so just to conclude, so let me tell you that basically, um, I think this is the most powerful part of SARA. So you have seen how to get analytical information, but you know that analytical information is, is nice, but with mathematical, there are many things that you cannot do. For example, doing numerical calculations in an efficient way and a reliable way, typically you want to do that with different codes. In C++ or in Fortran, in Python also, uh, for that, SARA has the, po the possibility to generate um, Fortran code, for example, for Sphino, or C++, C++ code for Micromegas. So tomorrow we'll, you will see how to use SARA to create input for Sphino to do numerical calculations in this model. So all the analytical information in SARA will be passed to Sphino in the way that Sphino can read it and implement it together with the normal numerical routines for diagonalizing matrices, calculating observables and so on. Okay, so this will be tomorrow. If you have any comment or question, if not, we can continue tomorrow. All right, so any further questions, everyone?
All right. So you you do? Okay. No, no. All right. So thank you so much, Avelino. It was very good, useful. Believe me, it was it, it was a lengthy lecture, but it was needed. So very much appreciated. So I hope you. you. I hope you find it useful. Yeah. So I hope to see you everyone again uh, tomorrow at 11 a.m. in our local time, and for Avelino mm -hmm. at four. All yes. right. Bye. Perfect. See you tomorrow. Bye. 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 Bye.